different topic which is consuming a lot of the media right now is of course Jeffrey Epstein the multi-millionaire pedophile who was uh, in a jail in New York City and was found dead or died later in a hospital a couple of days ago and we're joined to talk about that with Whitney Webb who's been all over the web uh, in a numerous <laughs> news I saw her on George Galloway's show and, uh, and, and other places and I'm really happy you joined us from I guess you're in Santiago, are you, Trilly? I am actually uh, 10 hours from there, but I generally just say that because most people uh, don't know other cities in Chile. But yeah, I'm in Chile. and uh, <laughs> the city you're in Chile? You want to say uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, I, I'm closest to Temuco is the name, but most people <laughs> don't know uh, where that is. That's fine. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. So Whitney, you've written this three-part series in Mint Press News. Uh, it's being widely quoted and referred to, and you've got a fourth one coming out that I know Elizabeth is quite keen on talking to you about. I just, the way I see this right now is something unusual in this scandal. There seems to be a feeding frenzy going on uh, in both the de Democratic and Republican sides of this story, so that both Fox and the others are interested because the targets, the potential targets uh, of a further investigation are Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. So I think both sides would like to see them both brought down. Uh, I wonder if you think that we might actually find out something. And I'm, by that, I mean, will there be a serious investigation by the Department of Justice? Or is there a conflict of interest there from Bill Barr, given that his father was the headmaster at the school that uh, hired Epstein to teach math without a degree, he had no degree. And of course, Barr himself was former CIA and his father was OSS. So are we gonna look at a serious investigation here going forward? Uh, I'm not expecting a serious investigation, and that's mainly because not just of Bill Barr's uh, connection to Epstein, I guess, uh, through his father, who worked at the Office of Strategic Services, um, but the fact of Bill Barr's own history. So for example, when he, I began work at the CIA, I believe in the in the 70s. Um, he worked at the Office of Legislative Council and basically what he spent most of his time doing there beginning in 1975 was stonewalling the church committee and efforts to sort of bring, um, you know, um, make the CIA accountable for covert operations in the past. And one of the things that he fought to keep coming to the public uh, were sexual blackmail operations, not unlike what Jeffrey Epstein was running. Um, and then again, as I point out in part two of my series, um, the Iran uh, Contra network, I guess you, uh, which is what I generally refer to it uh, as, but um, the, this intelligence community um, that was involved in that scandal, they had a lot of links to other sexual blackmail operations in the 80s. And when uh, some of those figures, um, you know, uh, were targeted by congressional investigations, it was Bill Barr that justified their legal pardons in 1991. Um, and then after that, you know, he went to, he worked for, um, he went back to the private sector, worked for Kirkland and Ellis, which is the firm that defended Epstein. So I think, you know, any one of those uh, would be a red flag, but all three together, I think, are concerning. And then you add in the fact that his father, um, you know, uh, hired Epstein at the Dalton School when he didn't, when Epstein did not have the credentials to work there. And one other really odd fact about Donald Barr is that right before he um, hired Epstein, he, he wrote a science fiction novel about human trafficking and sex slavery. So that is also another weird, um, but apparently you know, well, I would say somewhat relevant fact when we were, we're looking at the big picture here. So, you know, going forward, I don't really expect um, a full investigation. Bill Barr has refused uh, to recuse himself. We also have the fact that the FBI, um, after Epstein's arrest, waited uh, a really long time to raid several of the properties, including the property in, in the Virgin Islands, um, which they only raided after Epstein's death, to the best of my knowledge. The ranch in New Mexico that was Epstein's has still not been raided. Um, giving people ample time to remove evidence or cover things up, especially uh, if it is true what Alex Acosta said, um, that Epstein had was, was belonged or had links to intelligence, giving them plenty of time to cover up evidence. So I don't really, um, I don't expect all the truth to come out. I also, um, also worth pointing out that the fact that Epstein, uh, Epstein's death means that the criminal case against him goes away if no one else is charged. And that means that a lot of the evidence that was acquired um, during discovery or from the seizure of certain electronics will never be made public um, because that case will not be going forward now. Well, the fact that he's dead means they don't need a warrant as well to go into that New Mexico ranch. So 
it's troubling that they haven't. I have a million questions. I'm sure Elizabeth does too. I just want to get to the Broadway. Now, it has been talked about, and you've written that he had ties to intelligence agencies. Uh, the CIA and the Mossad have been mentioned. But what uh, real credible hard evidence besides circumstantial evidence do we have to link him to any intelligence agency in a black sexual blackmail operation? That's the idea. We need to gather in dirt on powerful people that the agents to hold over this. Okay, well, looking at Epstein's history itself, there become that there's some red flags there. Um, so one thing is that after he left to Bear Stearns um, in 1981, uh, he described himself to friends as working as a financial bounty hunter, basically uh, a quiet, uh, hunting down money that powerful people, including powerful people in governments, had lost, and also hiding money for those same powerful people, presumably for tax evasion, and doing sort of all these financial tricks, as it were. Um, and moving money from one place to another. Um, also during this time, according to Nigel Rosser, um, the British journalist who wrote in the Evening Standard in 2001, Epstein apparently for much of the 1990s claimed that he used to work for the CIA. And during this time in the early 1980s, um, he, uh, one of his known clients, according to Vicki Ward, who's one of the journalists that's written extensively on Epstein even before his first arrest, um, said that one of his clients during this time was Adnan Khashoggi, and Dan Khashoggi, of course, is the um, one of the arms dealers that was really um, pivotal in the Iran-Contra scandal. And why he was doing that, um, in, uh, in the late 70s, he had actually been recruited by the Mossad, and he was on Mossad payroll. Ooh. So, if I'm sorry, Epstein had a connection with Khashoggi. What was the connection? He was working for Khashoggi as this financial bounty hunter type of deal. One of his clients was Adnan Khashoggi, who was known to work with intelligence agencies and at the time, uh, Epstein was working with him, was on the payroll of the Mossad. That's according to Viktor Ostrovsky, who wrote, um, by way of deception, the former Mossad agent. Right. Well, I'm, I'm going to let Elizabeth take over in a second, but to, and I really want to get into the Iran-Contra angle in a moment, given its importance to our website, Bob Perry, of course, the founder, mm -hmm. and he is some of the biggest Iran-Contra stories and gave the world a name all over North, for example. But if he were an intelligence asset, let's say, why have, did they abandon him now because in the first instance in Florida case he was he was given a slap on the wrist this time they seemed serious they didn't the judge didn't give him bail and he was in jail and it looked like he was going down why did they seem to have withdrawn their support or did they well so I think one example um, that we can look at least on the historical record that may be relevant here to determine why would be what happened to Robert Maxwell for example who of course is Ghislaine Maxwell's father um, he was known to be very connected to the Mossad and doing work for them um, for uh, a large part of his career. And, and for instance, his uh, purchase of the Daily, uh, Daily Mirror Media Group was financed uh, by Mossad link, uh, Mossad link financiers, but at some point he became a liability um, for the Mossad. That's according to Gordon Thomas, uh, who wrote Gideon Spies and also wrote uh, another biography about Robert Maxwell and, and his work, uh, along with the work of Mark Dillon, they um, make a convincing argument that um, Maxwell, his mysterious death on his yacht that was ruled a suicide, that a lot of people, including Maxwell's own family, have, have contested, was actually a murder and that he had been um, taken out by the Mossad um, because he was more uh, of a liability than an asset at that point. But they still gave him this, you know, fancy state funeral, basically, that was attended by numerous um, Israeli heads of state and former and current heads of Israeli intelligence um, and gave him full honors. But they, they wanted to take him out of the picture because they were worried that he, um, you know, as I said, was more of a liability. He was demanding money to pay off his business debts because he'd been using this, this pension fund to fund his own uh, activities, I guess you could say, um, but also to fund um, Mossad uh, operations in Europe. He was involved in the sale of the Promise software that had a Mossad uh, or had an Israeli intelligence backdoor uh, planted into it. Um, and even though he did all these things for Israel um, and, and Israeli intelligence, um, he, he behaved erratically and started demanding things from them and had threatened to expose them if they didn't give him the money that he wanted to bail out his businesses. So something may have happened um, in a similar way to Epstein, it, it's not exactly clear why he was arrested, and there's a lot of speculation, a lot of different theories um, as to why he was arrested in July, considering the timing. Um, but I think, you know, it, it would fit with a lot of the other people that have been involved in this network over time that when they become a liability for whatever reason, if it's their own erratic behavior, or, you know, some people have said that he may have been arrested because there was, you know, um, a threat of like a mutiny at the FBI if they didn't go after him for certain reasons or something that they wanted to, you know, keep that, uh, that they wanted uh, to keep 
I guess the people below, like not the head honchos, right? But like people um, from, you know, taking evidence out into the public or something, that, that's one theory I've heard. And that's why he was taken, uh, why he was arrested. You know, there may have been concern that he had become a liability. Um, and that's why he, you know, there were efforts to either cover this up, uh, which would explain the, the delay in the FBI raids and things like that. And then if he was um, murdered or suicided, whatever anyone wants to believe about his death, um, that could have been done if he had become a liability um, and he had intelligence ties. Sorry, Elizabeth, I have, I have to ask one more, then I'll turn it over to you for as long as you want. Uh, I heard one other theory, Whitney, and that is that after the collapse of the collusion theory and the Mueller uh, official report, which said there was no collusion and uh, the obstruction of justice attempt failed, that this was a way to try to get at Trump. The Southern District of New York has been looking into Trump's finances as a way to bring him down, and maybe they thought that they could get Epstein to to spill the dirt that he had on Trump, and that I think the entire country would back to most of it anyway, uh, an impeachment against Trump if it could be shown mm. he'd engaged in this kind of uh, abusive underage girls, whereas that's kind of a non-political uh, crime. Right, well, that's possible. Um, another political theory that's come up is this, this actually may have had more to do with Israeli political infighting given uh, the upcoming Israeli elections that Ehud Barak is pitted against Netanyahu. Netanyahu is facing numerous corruption allegations, uh, mainly related to bribery, but Ehud Barak uh, didn't really have scandals at the time until Jeffrey Epstein was arrested in the full swing of the Israeli election cycle. And then when you compare bribery to someone having a, a, a several year uh, lengthy association and friendship and business partnership, with uh, an accused pedophile sex trafficker, bribery stops looking so bad. And also there's the fact that Ehud Barak was also tied into Leslie Wexner and this mega group or so-called um, mega donor group who are at odds with Netanyahu currently, even though they previously backed him because they're mostly secular. Netanyahu was trying to sort of forge alliances with a far right religious elements uh, in Israel that a lot of people in the mega group oppose um, because most of them, as I said, are secular. Some are actually even atheists like Michael Steinhardt. And, and are opposed to those sorts of um, religious extremist elements that Netanyahu's trying to court and is trying to make an alliance with, which is why there's elections now, um, because he was not able to form a coalition government previously. So that's another political theory um, that has been uh, advanced uh, as well. So I think there's a couple different angles there, but if there was an angle to go after Trump or make this something about US politics, um, I think that's definitely possible, but I think the fact that Epstein, at least his activities in the U.S. were so, uh, his associations and friendships were um, very bipartisan. I think it's really hard to try and just laser target it to take down Trump and not end up taking down um, a large number of other people that were not the intended targets. Well, that's why I said at the beginning that both sides are going after this to get their, their targets. But, uh, Elizabeth, in a second, because uh, at the beginning of the show, we talked about the congresswomen who the Israelis were not allowed to go to the West Bank. That decision by Netanyahu was reversed just a little while ago, and that probably had something to do with the election campaign as well. Elizabeth, please. Yeah, I, I, a minute ago, you were talking about the fact that Epstein, you know, is one face of many kind of iterations of the same type of system, this blackmail system. And in your series, one of the people that you talk about as a central figure is kind of Roy Cohn. And you talk about uh, Epstein sort of filling Cohen's shoes after Cohen died in the late 1980s. And I was wondering, um, do you think there is any face or any um, new replacement of, the, of Epstein as a figure in this kind of blackmail operation that you see coming up? Or is there is, it, is it that sort of a vacuum waiting to be filled at this point? Oh, I think there's definitely other, other Epsteins out there. Um, even when Roy Cohn was running his sexual blackmail operation, there were numerous others that sort of splintered off or worked with him. Um, and a lot of the ones, um, a lot of these rings um, that I detail in, in parts one and part two, they involved young boys. Um, Epstein, of course, is known for targeting young girls. So I think even uh, parallel with, with, with um, what Epstein was doing, there, were, there was very likely another Epstein that was involved in the trafficking and, and abuse and exploitation of young boys. Um, and I think, um, this sort of activity has gone on for decades and there has been uh, the CIA or intelligence or whoever's involved in this, uh, we can you know, speculate exactly who has the most blame, um, but they've been allowed to do this with impunity for a matter of decades. I don't think they expect um, to be held to account now. And so I would expect those sort of activities to continue unless something uh, dramatically changes. 
So you, earlier, right before we uh, started this interview, we were talking a little bit about the, the article that you are yet to publish that will be published very soon, the fourth part of your series. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the focus that you're uh, looking, the focuses you're looking into in that story and give us a little bit of a preview of it? Okay, um, so what I'm gonna be going into is more on the Iran-Contra side and showing how Democrats fit in here because in a lot of my, um, the previous installments of my series, I've mostly focused on Republicans. So I'm gonna be tying in um, some Democrats, namely the Clinton family, because of course the Clintons were well known to have associated with Epstein. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be tracing um, the earliest years of the Epstein-Clinton relationship, which actually go back to when Clinton was first in office in 1993. Uh, even though a lot of mainstream press reports like to say that it was after he left office, there's uh, substantial evidence that this was much earlier. He was attending donor, uh, you know, donor uh, dinners for Clinton as early as 1993 with Ghislaine Maxwell, um, and that they, he was um, an important topic when uh, powerful Clinton. Uh, uh, donors like like Lynn Forrester to Rothschild would speak with Clinton at, a, at, at meetings in like 1995. One of the topics she would use in her short time of access to the president was to, uh, was to discuss Jeffrey Epstein. And this was in 1995, right? So uh, he, he was much more influential uh, with Clinton than has been led on in the press for several years. And this is including the press coverage that came out uh, after his arrest. Um, and as I mentioned, the Iran-Contra network, the Clintons are definitely tied into that as well, but they're, uh, with what was going on at the MENA airport um, and their connections to people like Jackson Stevens, Hillary Clinton's connections to BCCI, um, and through her work at Rose Law Firm in Arkansas and some other things like that. So I'll be tying them into the bigger picture too of the network um, that I'm discussing. And I, I will also be talking about um, the, the, uh, Mark Rich, who is another uh, mega group connected businessman um, one mega group connected businessman I already talked about uh, in part three of my series was Robert Maxwell, but I didn't get to Mark Rich yet. And I'll be talking about him because of course his, um, it was pardoned by Clinton and Clinton let Clinton's last days of office. And so he has some um, relevance to this network I'm describing and how this sort of blackmail um, uh, operation has, has advanced though, uh, because Clinton, um, Part of the uh, allegedly part of the reason he pardoned Mark Rich was because he had been targeted by um, Israeli espionage. And so, for example, with the Monica Lewinsky scandal, for example, the first person that knew of that scandal allegedly was Netanyahu, who was prime minister at the time and claimed to have tapes of phone conversations that Clinton had had with Monica Lewinsky and attempted to use that to influence him. Um, and of course, the Mark Rich pardon was largely sought by members of the mega group like Michael Steinhardt, who used to be an investment partner of Mark Rich. Um, and Ehud Barak, of course, who we know is a, a close friend, or was a close friend, he's trying to distance himself now um, from Jeffrey Epstein. It, as uh, detailed in your articles, there's a, almost an infinitude of connections of the rich, powerful, and uh, yeah. you know, incredibly wealthy individuals. So what, I mean, I know that Joe asked about this um, earlier, but I'd like to ask again. So what are some of the additional intelligence ties that Epstein ha had that you may um, either have written about in, in your piece or, already or uh, will publish in this new article? Okay, um, well, the ones I haven't published yet are gonna be the one I already mentioned, which is in the 1980s. He said he, uh, he would told people later in the 90s he was working for the CIA um, and that he was working with people like Adnan Khashoggi. Of course, the other uh, main intelligence connection would be his uh, partner in crime, as it were, Ghislaine Maxwell, whose father was a known Mossad operative. And they teamed up and were working together by at least 1993, but they met in 1991 because Ghislaine Maxwell left um, England for, um, New York shortly after her father's death. Um, and she has often been, uh, she, before her father died, she was um, involved in a lot of his business activities, including his shadier business activities on a lot of his uh, uh, somewhat suspect yacht parties. She was frequently present with a lot of highly influential uh, people from the United States and Israel and England. So she's been in sort of the swamp as it were um, for a very long time. And um, she was definitely very involved in the sexual blackmail operation that later came out of this partnership and, and, and went forward. Um, we also know that by 1993, Epstein was able to get himself out of significant legal trouble. In 1987, he had teamed up with Steve Hoffenberg uh, and had been employed by Tower Financial, which collapsed in 1993 uh, in one of the largest Ponzi schemes in US history. And, um, Epstein, uh, according to Hoffenberg and according to substantial internal evidence from Tower Financial, had really been the brains behind this Ponzi scheme and was named in the case 
And when this came to light in 1993, his name was dropped from the case and he wasn't prosecuted, but Hoffenberg was, um, despite the overwhelming evidence that Epstein had been intimately involved, even though he had left the company uh, prior to its implosion. So that implies then that he was already getting these sort of sweetheart deals um, for, uh, you know, because he had friends in high places, it could be said, right? And this was before, we uh, we don't know then that his um, sexual operation, uh, the blackmail operation had begun in earnest, but it appears that he had already developed these connections by this time. Um, another thing that I think is is circumstantial but notable is what um, how he acquired his New York townhouse and this, of course, uh, was given to him by Leslie Wexner. Leslie Wexner bought um, the New York townhouse in 1989. He bought it for $13 million. And he spent uh, millions of dollars more refurbishing it, uh, putting all this expensive art in it. And he also installed a very odd bathroom that was uh, hidden under the stairs. It was lined with lead to prevent electronic surveillance from coming in or out. And if you open the cabinets in this so-called bathroom, there was uh, CCTV, all this recording equipment, and things like that, um, that showed you know uh, all the different rooms in the house and was capable of recording things that were going on in that house. And that was before Epstein even lived in that house. And Wexner, um, by his own admission, never lived there. So this man, uh, this powerful billionaire, spent millions of dollars, uh, basically put it, making a, a, a you know a fancy furnished spy house, basically with CCTV, and then he gives it to Epstein. Uh, according to a 1996 New York Times article, Epstein was already living in that house and had been for a few years. So we don't know exactly when he began to live there, but it appears around to be around the same time, um, 1993, when he was, you know, associating with, with the Clintons and had gotten out of this lawsuit and whatnot. And then going forward in the years after, uh, this house is transferred to Epstein or a, a trust that Epstein owned uh, for a dollar. So it was it given him to, to him for free. And of course, um, there's a lot has been said about where did Epstein's wealth come from and was he really a billionaire? The more people that have looked into this, the more it, the more it has become clear that his wealth, he was made to look wealthy. A lot of his, uh, his alleged hedge fund, uh, where this wealth was supposed to have come from, uh, people on Wall Street, when they were asked about it, said they'd never heard of it, they'd never done business with it, by all appearances it didn't exist. Um, and so beyond that, his wealth was supposed to have come from his uh, financial consulting service, but his only known client was Leslie Wexner. So by all appearances, it appears that he was given, um, he was made to look rich and all of his assets he was essentially uh, given. And that to me sort of, um, and his association with Elaine Maxwell and his past suggests that this uh, very well could have been an intelligence operation, um, especially considering the nature of the activity that he was collecting uh, blackmail and trying to get powerful people, um, and not just politicians, celebrities, scientists, um, a lot of other prominent people into compri compromising positions and Ghislaine Maxwell and Epstein would brag about uh, all the uh, material they had accumulated that was compromising of so many people. So um, I think, you know, when you take everything together and uh, in addition to the fact that Alex Acosta said the reason he approved the sweetheart deal originally was that Epstein had ties to intelligence, I think it makes a convincing case there was definitely involvement of intelligence agencies here as to whether the CIA was more involved or the Mossad was more involved um, is really difficult to know. But I think there is there, there is definitely uh, involvement of both to some extent. Um, both agencies are known to uh, very much uh, um, seek out blackmail and acquire much of it as possible. Not that they're unique in that, but they're definitely known for uh, having used sexual blackmail operations for decades. Um, particularly with prostitutes, but what we're seeing here with Epstein and some of the other cases that I point out in my reports is that there are also ones that involve children or underage people because obviously if someone is, is blackmailed with them with a prostitute, well then that looks, you know, lewd and, and it's, a, it, it's adultery if they're married, but if it's them with a, chi with a child, I mean obviously it's, it's there's no way to come back from that in a political career. So it's definitely a, a different level of, of, of leverage that, that you would obtain there, but there is no justification for any intelligence agency to use a child in this sort of activity. So I think that's part of why this is being covered up, um, or, or rather that the mainstream media uh, is specifically distracting from this in, uh, or trying to um, minimize this intelligence angle. Uh, because it would mean that intelligence agencies are involved in the abuse and exploitation of children when there's no justifiable reason to do so. You can't say, oh yeah, I'm running, uh, we're running a pedophile ring in the interest of national security. No one's going to believe that. 
Absolutely. No, it's, it's fascinating in its horror, but I was also going to ask you, uh, you know, what about these documents, the 2000 plus documents that were released within 24 hours before Epstein died? Have you been able to look through those and have you found anything that is new and or interesting or of significance at this time? Or, uh, you know, do you think that that maybe the release of those documents had anything whatsoever to do with uh, Epstein's uh, death, as it were? Well, it was a partial release, and I believe this was the partial release that was being sought by people like Alan Dershowitz and um, I believe Mike Cernovich's lawyer um, and, and people like that. Um, and originally, uh, Alan Dershowitz and, and I guess you could say his allies in getting this partial, not full release of this case, it was a civil case, um, was aimed at getting more information about the victims that had come forward and um, information that could have been used to target them. Um, because, of course, we know that Alan Dershowitz has been on a lengthy media campaign to try and discredit all of the claims against him um, and the fact that he has been accused of, of raping some of Epstein's victims, uh, in some cases multiple times, and he's been trying to widely uh, discredit that as, as much as possible, and this was believed to have been, he felt there was something in this case that he was specifically requesting as part of this partial release could uh, improve his case, and there's a reason he was asking for the partial, not the full, uh, disclosure of that. So I think that's significant. And I also think it's significant that a day after that's released, Epstein uh, is killed or, or is found dead rather. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's totally fine. I think it's yeah. really, it's really difficult to kind of, um, you know, uh, go along with the idea that he, that he, uh, you know, committed suicide, but well, that's a whole other discussion. And I also think that you could, we could have an entire interview just about the, the role of Mike Cernovich in trying to get those documents released as well. I mean, that's a huge, a huge topic of conversation, but there's one uh, kind of tangential uh, subject I wanted to, to ask you about, uh, because you mentioned uh, his, his role, not only in the rich and powerful, but also in medical sciences. He donates to Harvard. There are, he has a lot of scientific uh, friends and, connect, and ties. I wanted to ask you about uh, his, I believe it's the Epstein, uh, Jeffrey Epstein Four Foundation, the scientific <laughs> foundation that he runs. And, and ha have you covered that? Will you cover that? Has anyone really discussed that? foundation to date uh, in relation to this scandal? Well, I think some people ha have looked, uh, um, looked at, you know, the money flow because, it, 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 as I mentioned, it's hard to know where his wealth come from, came from, but it's much easier to see what he spent his money on. And he definitely spent a lot of time in philanthropy. And that actually, um, I argue in my piece, has been used by a lot of powerful businessmen uh, to sort of cover up their more, um, I guess, um, you know, uh, mm, unpleasant activities, I guess you could say, um, that by saying, by donating heavily to different causes, um, in Epstein's case, mostly science, one can say, I am a philanthropist, and it sort of distracts from all the other activity that he's doing, um, because then they don't have to look into, oh, is he really a hedge fund manager? They can just say, a financier and philanthropist, and this is what was done with Epstein well before his first arrest as well. For example, Bill Clinton, when he was asked about Epstein, prior to Epstein's arrest said, oh, he's a great philanthropist, right? So it definitely provides cover for activity in, in, in some sense. And this really goes back to the days of J.D. Rockefeller, um, when Rockefeller's uh, public reputation uh, was very negative um, because of how much he owned and how powerful he was. He started donating to certain causes to rebrand himself in the press as a philanthropist. Um, specifically as to his foundations, um, I'm mostly, my series is mostly looking at the history um, of what was going on here and trying to place Jeffrey Epstein in the context of a larger network that was known to also use these operations and the ties between what he was doing and the ties to these other rings that were known to have existed. So my series is mostly stopping around the time frame of like 2001 more or less with some uh, discussion of Epstein's connections to people like Bill Clinton and to the present just to underscore that this was a relationship that continued beyond that. Um, I do believe some people have done reporting on his financials but a lot of this has come from outlets like the Daily Beast and things like that that have been very aggressive about getting those types of financial records. Um, and it hasn't really shown, you know, much shady activity. It just mostly shown what he was giving causes to, though um, the New York Times recently reported an article, uh, reported that there may have been an ulterior motive to his extreme interest in science, which was the fact that he had a, um, a strong interest in transhumanism and eugenics, and that he had planned to use his New Mexican, uh, his, his ranch in New Mexico. Um, to basically try and create a, a like a master race of, of people by taking uh, it, it, it's very bizarre. I just I, I don't even uh, just read the New York Times article for yourself about um, what 
Jeffrey Epstein told scientists he was interested in doing and uh, what parts of his body he wanted cryogenically frozen <laughs> um, to use in the future. Um, it's quite bizarre, so I'd rather uh, not get into that. You can look in that, into that for yourself and speculate as to what he was uh, interested in when it came to the sciences, but definitely not a normal interest uh, in scientific advancement. <laughs> I think, uh, definitely. I think they meant philander and not philanthropist. Isn't that right? <laughs> uh, I think that, well, I mean, th these were in press reports, things like that. I think that would have been more accurate. But, but uh, as I um, try and point out, um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people have tried to use this, this uh, philanthropic or, or philanthropist label to kind of distract from other things they were doing. So, for example, Samuel Bronfman, um, who I talk about a little bit in my piece, um, he was. Uh, during Prohibition uh, in Canada, he gained sort of a nasty reputation for his ties to the mob, specifically the American mob and Mayor Lansky. And he always wanted this sort of high society uh, prestige. He wanted to be a university president or a senator. And because of his ties to the mob, that prevented him from doing so. So he attempted to rebrand as a philanthropist, giving a lot of his money or a lot of his ill-gotten wealth, rather, um, a way to philanthropic, uh, philanthropic causes, sort of allowing uh, the media to rehabilitate his image and allow him to sort of gain that high society prestige that he had always wanted. So you've revealed Wexler's secret, um, his, this bathroom where I guess no one should take a shower because the steam might affect the electronics in there. <laughs> I, I don't think it was, it had a shower. It was just like a small uh, bathroom with a, you know, a toilet and a sink and some cabinets, but you open the cabinets and there also, there's all this bizarre stuff there. But another secret of Wexner's that hasn't really gotten much media attention is his ties to organized crime. Um, a 1985 police report in Columbus, Ohio, um, revealed that he was, he was, um, the main uh, transporter of his goods uh, at the limited company uh, had strong ties to the Genovese crime family, which of course ties into Mayor Lansky as well in the National Crime Syndicate, um, which is actually um, uh, a crime, which is actually um, a crime network that has a lot of connections to the mega group, including family connections. Michael Steinhardt, who I mentioned earlier, his father was Mayor Lansky's like personal jewel. So, um, but Wexner in particular has been able to sort of cover up his ties to organized crime quite effectively. Um, and actually that 1985, um, that investigation to that 1985 murder was actually covered up by the police commissioner because after the investigation concluded, he preferred to leave the murder unsolved and not go forward with, with the conclusion of the investigation because he considered the conclusion of the investigation to be libelous. That was his, uh, his word. And of course, um, what, the report was not supposed to come out. Oh, sorry. What murder are you talking about, I'm sorry? Uh, the murder of Arthur Shapiro in Columbus, Ohio, who was a lawyer that at the time of his death was uh, representing Leslie Wexner's company, uh, L Brands. Mm -hmm. Wexner, of course, is uh, the creator of Victoria's Secret, hence my... Well, he purchased it from someone else, but yeah, he owns Victoria's Secret, Bath and Body Works, Abercrombie and Fitch, um, a lot of well-known mall brands uh, to people in the United States. Uh, oh. A lot of them having to do with uh, intimate uh, clothing or preteen clothing. Pre He's also been accused of raping Epstein's victims as well, Leslie Wexner. Before I go into the Ron Contra a little bit, uh, and the history of this network that you seem to be showing as a thread from Lansky's days all the way mm -hmm. Uh, how do you feel the uh, about the New York Times coverage on that? They've done a lot, and they've written a lot about Wexner as well. On the whole, how would you grade their coverage of this story? Oh, of, of Wexner's creation to Epstein, uh, his connection know, to Epstein. Times coverage of this of the whole Epstein story. How would you rate that? <clears throat> um. Well, I don't know. It would take me a while to settle on a number between one and ten or something like that. But I do definitely have concerns about it. I think they focused on more um, sensational aspects, like as I mentioned, the sort of New Mexico ranch eugenics angle um, was one of their recent stories on Jeffrey Epstein. Um, but when it came to you know his billionaire friends and his, his powerful allies, they published stories saying that Epstein was solely responsible for that and that billionaires had been hoodwinked and deceived by Epstein. They didn't know what was going on um, and sort of offsetting all the blame um, that people like Leslie Wexner would have had um, or, or any forena or prior knowledge or things like that of what he was doing. And I think that is total bunk. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, you know, Wexner gave him this townhouse with all the spy equipment already in it. Also, um, Epstein, um, 
was at, in 1996 contracted an artist named Maria Farmer to do, I believe, a mural or some sort of artwork in one of Wexner's uh, mansions in Ohio. And then Epstein sexually assaulted her. She called the police and tried to leave, but it was Wexner's personal security guards that prevented her from leaving for 12 hours. So to say that Wexner had no idea uh, that Epstein was into this sort of stuff and had this sort of behavior and had no idea that what was going on, um, the evidence does not support that, but the New York Times had sort of put the spin sort of to protect his powerful allies and billionaires uh, and these billionaires, you know, of association with Epstein, allowing them to more successfully distance themselves from him by saying, oh, he didn't know, and he was so, um, now, charming and manipulative that he just deceived us, I think that um, is actually a very da damaging narrative, um, frankly, because it, it, it allows them to evade accountability when some of them clearly knew. I think the Times did seem to imply that uh, by raising the question, how did Epson get all this money from Wexner? How did he get in charge of his finances suddenly? And what was Wexner getting in return? And the implication is he was getting his services, if I can call it that, uh, with these young girls. Well, some people have said that, um, but I didn't really get that from the New York Times. I mean, I think they were more saying like, uh, well, it, they, they definitely gave a lot of lip service to Wexner's own excuse, which is like, I had no idea that he was doing this stuff with my money. And I only found out recently that we had been, uh, that he had like pilfered funds from our foundation because he was on the board of the Wexner Foundation. And, and all of this other stuff um, and, and attempted to say, um, we didn't know he was doing any anything wrong, but as soon as we discovered it, you know, we, we fired him and we just, we, we ended our association with him and all of this stuff. But I'm just, um, the, uh -huh. I'm just wondering if you were surprised that the Times hasn't pursued the Trump angle more on this. I am. Well, um, I think the New York Times uh, knows that the more, uh, if you pull on the on, on some of these threads, a lot of information powerful people don't want to come out will come out. Um, so I think that's what. But I think on, on another level, I think um, as you mentioned earlier, we've seen sort of the weaponization um, of the Epstein case for partisan gain on both sides, um, and that's been particularly true on the right, where they're saying like, oh, it's only Epstein and Clinton, or oh, it's only Epstein and Trump. Um, I think both of those are really damaging um, in the sense that it distracts from the fact that this is a bipartisan issue. Um, and that Epstein was close to people, of, uh, you know, on both sides. And it's really just being, you know, weaponized to sort of exacerbate um, the divisive nature of American politics today, um, instead of actually trying to get to the bottom of what was actually going on. Um, so I, I don't really like uh, that narrative. And I think also the New York Times is trying to uh, perhaps remain uh, sort of out of that partisan uh, pushing. Um, maybe they, you know, did suffer, um, you know, political points to avoid being attacked by the president. I mean, who knows? But I also would like to point out that Trump's ties to the Epstein network date back to Roy Cohn. Uh, Roy Cohn had a lot of powerful friends in New York and also some powerful columnist friends at the New York Times. So I think if they were to go after Trump and sort of highlight Epstein's ties to Trump dating back to the late 80s and early 90s, that they would also air out a lot of dirty laundry that people in New York, where the New York Times, of course, is based, uh, would not do not want coming out. All right, so let's move to the historical nature of your uh, story, and then I want to ask you about Iran Contra a little more. You seem to be implying that this black sexual blackmail network, uh, which of course have existed in all countries, with all kinds of intelligence agencies, but then you seem to be saying, I could be wrong, that there's a direct link between the early days of Lansky and uh, intelligence, all the way up to including Epstein. Is that right? And how does Epstein fit into that? Okay, so yeah, it takes a lot of time to sort of explain and make this case, which is why my article, uh, originally I was just going to make a two-part article, and it has now turned into four, because um, there, there's a lot of stuff there. But basically, to overview, um, this sort of sexual blackmail operation as it has, has been conducted in the United States, it was pioneered not by intelligence agencies, it was pioneered by the mob. Um, specifically the National Crime Syndicate, which basically took over um, American organized crime networks by joining up the Jewish mob and the Italian mobs um, in the early 20s, allowing them to sort of join forces and consolidate control. Um, and this was done by Lucky Luciano and, and Mayor Lansky. Um, we know that um, according to Virginia Hill, who uh, was like the mistress of the mob, so to speak, and Bugsy Siegel's girlfriend, that she had been sent by Mayor Lansky to Mexico uh, to try and entrap 
foreign diplomats there uh, in bugged hotel rooms to acquire blackmail. And we also know that in the, uh, during World War II, um, there was Operation Underworld where the OSS, the forerunner to the CIA, um, forged a, an, an illicit alliance, if you will, um, with organized crime, specifically Lansky and Luciano. Um, and that actually, even though it was supposed to be out of wartime necessity, uh, continued, that alliance continued uh, decades later and arguably still today, um, and uh, it especially became strong in the 1960s um, when the CIA, uh, um, you know, put a lot of people that were associated with Lansky and assassination teams and tried to use, um, you know, those connections to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba. But going back to the days of the OSS, we know that Lansky and William Donovan, who was director of the OSS, were exchanging blackmail specifically on J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was sort of in this battle of wills with Donovan because he wanted the OSS to basically go away after the war. He didn't want it to be established as a permanent agency because he was afraid that would limit his power as FBI director. So they tried Hoover and Donovan tried to get the worst blackmail on the other one and Donovan with the help of the mob um, acquired uh, the superior blackmail as it were on Hoover of him being engaged in sexual relationships with one of his top aides at the time, Clyde Tolson. Um, and of course, at that time, being caught in a uh, secret uh, homosexual relationship was very politically damaging, very different than today, um, because of course, this was the 1940s. Um, and so that is, um, you know, uh, one example of how organized crime and the CIA uh, were sharing intelligence, uh, but really blackmail, uh, going back to the days of their first alliance, and this continued well on into the, um, arguably into the present. So um, moving forward, um, eventually, as I point out in part one of my series, in, in the beginning of the 1950s, um, there was a sexual blackmail ring involving uh, boys um, that involved Louis Rosenstiel, who's another Mayor Lansky um, businessman, who was the owner of Shinley Liquors, and he had a very cozy relationship with J. Edgar Hoover. Actually, J. Edgar Hoover's, uh, I think, longtime, um, one of his longtime aides, Louis Nichols, was given the number two post, plus lots of lucrative stock options at Rosenstiel's company. Um, and Roy Cohn was also involved um, in this as well. And Rosenstiel was originally um, running a sort of um, a mob linked sexual blackmail operation out of his house. Um, and it, it, but this was, um, later expanded and Roy Cohn, uh, who was general counsel to McCarthy during this time, eventually took it over and began to run it out of the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan um, in a suite that became rather infamous, but in hushed tones nonetheless, um, that was suite 233. Um, and it was uh, later revealed by um, court documents, uh, a divorce court ruling, um, the, 19, the early 1970s New York investigation into organized crime. Um, and also um, an admission of guilt basically by Roy Cohn to James Rothstein, who was uh, one of the NYPD detectives in charge of the human trafficking division, that Roy Cohn indeed was involved in trafficking young boys for the purposes of sexual blackmail, and that that had begun as part of this anti-communist crusade uh, that, that began in the McCarthy era and was used to get either people to go along with McCarthyism or, or to leverage it for political, um, you know, to basically threaten people with, um, if you don't do what you want, we'll take you down as either part of the McCarthy hearings or um, just, you know, make these pictures public and give it to our friends in the press. As I pointed point out in part two of my series, Roy Cohn was extremely connected uh, to pretty much almost every uh, mainstream outlet of the period. His childhood friends, for example, one of them was the publisher of the National Enquirer. Uh, the other one was the owner of Condé Nast magazines, which includes uh, New the New Yorker, GQ, Esquire, um, Vanity Fair, um, a bunch of other magazines. He was also very close with William Buckley, um, a very prominent um, conservative journalist, William Sapphire, uh, who worked for the New York Times. Uh, one of his closest friends was Barbara Walters. I mean, this, this, and he was also close friends with Rupert Murdoch. And actually, it was Roy Cohn, um, as Bob Perry reported, right? Um, it was Roy Cohn that got Rupert Murdoch uh, connected uh, to the Reagan White House. So he was definitely super tied into the press um, and able to weaponize that, not just to protect his own operations, but to use it to threaten other people um, if blackmail didn't work. And he was also able to kill stories just by calling the media moguls that he was close to. Well, where does that um, Okay, so... Um, this is basically just the history of this operation at Roy Cohn, so that takes us to part one. Um, 
at, in part two of my series, I point out how Roy Cohn um, and, and um, intelligence agencies during this time, including this Iran-Contra network, which as I mentioned earlier, Epstein was um, appeared to have been connected to in the early 1980s. They were running a lot of, there was a lot of sexual blackmail operations um, connected to that network. Um, some of which uh, came to be known in the press and a lot of them had direct connections to Roy Cohn. So for example, Craig Spence, who was a conservative Washington lobbyist, um, who was running, he ran the infamous White House cowboy ring, it's sometimes called, um, because some of the um, boys he exploited, he would take on midnight tours of the White House. Um, he was known to host birthday parties for Roy Cohn at his house. He claimed that Roy Cohn was one of his close friends. He also claimed to be close friends with William Casey, CIA director at the time, that most of his activities were going on. Um, and he was, you know, uh, he, his whole house, he would host these parties in his house, um, and his his house was known to, uh, was later revealed to have been heavily bogged with electronic uh, equipment. Uh, Craig Spence also claimed to have worked for the CIA and set, and claimed to have um, been involved to some extent in, in drug smuggling during that period. Of course, we know that that was definitely going on, um, that the CIA was definitely involved in that with Iran-Contra. Um, among other things, that drug smuggling was definitely part of that, and some of that cocaine would appear at a party Spence hosted at his house, and he would also use that as blackmail for people that did not engage um, the minors he had at the president uh, at the premises. Um, he would, you know, photograph or, or film them uh, using illegal drugs, basically in this period. Uh, while conveniently the Reagan administration was doing this, so just say no to drugs and the drug war and all of that, uh, which of course meant that if you were shown. Uh, partaking in cocaine, it would have been very politically damaging at the time. Um, and when people were investigating Craig Spence, they found um, another sex ring uh, that was being run out of Nebraska that was run by Larry King, who had connections to um, uh, several Iran-Contra connections, and actually the front of his uh, uh, his sex ring was a credit union that was being used um, for to sort of launder Iran-Contra money as well. Um, and, um, and, and there's a few other ones that I lay out in, in, in my piece as well, and there's some other Iran-Contra connections, but those are the big two. It was known during that time that Spence and King, their rings were actually connected, and they were part, they um, operated under an umbrella group that was called Bodies by God, or that was the code name for it, according to intelligence sources that had been quoted by John DeCamp, who was one of the main investigators, um, and a former Nebraska state senator that really looked into the Franklin case. Um, so, um, taking that into consideration, um, Epstein's connections to intelligence in the 1980s, um, going forward in his ties to Ghislaine Maxwell, um, a lot of these rings that I just mentioned were broken up um, or were exposed pretty much right around the same time that Epstein appeared to have gotten involved in the sort of activities around like 1993 um, or so. By that time, the Franklin uh, scandal had already been covered up. I believe it was exposed in the early 90s. Um, what Craig Spence was doing was exposed between 1980, 1989 and 1990, um, and I think because of the the, the connections that he, they're, they're, um, the connections um, that intelligence was you know um, was known to be have been involved in this sort of stuff, and that uh, Epstein himself had some connection uh, to Iran Contra figures um, and had was powerfully connected enough uh, to to different people, including the Clintons, who also had a role in Iran Contra um, to some extent. I think it makes a convincing case, um, knowing what Epstein later, you know, was later up to, that he may have, uh, it's very possible and very likely that he may have been in an iteration um, of this, um, you know, sort of um, dynasty, I guess you could say, um, of sexual blackmail operations that date back decades. Um, but it's hard to know exactly how this network developed. What we do know is that from, you know, this one that began in the 1950s, it grew and it splintered and it expanded. Um, a lot of the ones that I mentioned previously, they involve mostly boys. Um, so the the Franklin one uh, in Nebraska involved boys and girls. Um, and going beyond that, um, it's hard to know. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this sort of um, it, this leads me to think that Epstein was not an isolated case, um, and that there were people that were um, exploiting boys while he was exploiting girls, or there may have been one that exploited boys and girls at the same time. It's really hard to know. Um, exactly how um, the division and, uh, you know, um, exactly what types of um, pedophile rings these people are into and how many of them are, um, because of course all of this, it, they're trying, this is not something the CIA or any other intelligence agency, whether it's the CIA or the Mossad, would publicly admit to being involved to, 
So we just have to go from the evidence of what we know. Um, and based on that, and the fact that we know now that Epstein had intelligence ties, and that's how we got that 2008 sweetheart deal. Um, I think that if we look at his history, and we look at the people he was connected to, that he was a part of this network. I think um, I make a convincing case for that in my reports. It's hard to sort of expand on all the connections uh, here in an interview, um, because there's a lot of them. So um, anyone that's interested in seeing how all this connects together uh, in a broader way, I would encourage to read my, my reports. Well, okay. Now, Acosta was the prosecutor in Florida that gave the sweetheart deal, and then he became Trump's labor secretary and had to resign when this scandal broke uh, recently. Uh, what exactly did Acosta uh, claim to have said when he was in the interview for the job at the Trump I mean, in the Trump transition team? What did he say about uh, about Epstein's connections to intelligence? Well, he was intentionally very vague. I mean, they basically just asked him why he had approved the deal. And he said, oh, I was told Epstein was above intelligence. He's above my pay grade. And he just let it go and, and approved it. I mean, what we do know is that in, in U.S. political circles, people that are willing to turn a blind eye to certain things often get promoted. Um, this is also true in, in, in the mainstream press. You know, if you're willing to toe the line that, that people ask of you, um, generally it, off, it, it leads to promotions. If, if Acosta, for example, had said, I don't care that he's tied to intelligence, I'm going to prosecute this guy because he's a pedophile sex trafficker, I, I really doubt that he would have been um, promoted to labor secretary. Well, but he, because of that, he uh, got axed as labor secretary. So uh, it, it came back to bite him in the end. Tell mm -hmm. me more about Clinton, the Clinton's connection to Iran-Contra, if you can. Uh, sure. So uh, the Clinton, um, one of the, the main hubs, I guess you could say, in the United States for a lot of this stuff that was going on uh, with Iran-Contra uh, happened in Arkansas. Arkansas. Uh, this was through people like Barry Seal um, and Terry Reid um, and some other uh, CIA operatives, or uh, some of them like Barry Seal were DEA and CIA dual operatives. Um, and this was being run out of um, rural Arkansas. Um, and, you know, uh, there were people at, at, at Mina Airport, there was um, apparently drugs that were coming in that were coming from South America. There were also people, um, because not that far from Mina, there was, um, I forget the name of a national forest, but there's a national forest like 10 miles north of there. And that's where um, Nicaraguan Contras and some other Latin American, uh, I guess, paramilitary recruits. Um, were trained by people like Oliver North and people that were working for him. Harry Seal and, and Terry Reed um, had associations or were, in, in Reed's case, were directly working for Oliver North um, during that time. And um, Terry Reed later, later said that a lot of the drug money um, that was coming in or coming uh, back or, or resulting from the sale of this stuff was laundered by um, financial institutions in Arkansas um, during that time. And uh, there have been plenty of reports uh, pointing the, co the connections um, of those financial institutions to the Clintons. Um, another Iran uh, Contra figure that was involved in uh, the BCCI Bank, which is the CIA linked bank that was involved in a lot of money laundering for um, Iran Contra, was very connected to Jackson Stevens, who was a major uh, political backer, not just of Ronald Reagan, but also of Bill Clinton in Arkansas politics. Um, and actually, it was Hillary Clinton who represented. Um, Jackson Steve, uh, many of his Jackson Stephen, uh, uh, many of his business interests in Arkansas through Rose Law Firm, and actually she was one of the lawyers that helped bring BCCI, which was originally founded in Pakistan, um, that brought it to the United States, allowing it to be um, heavily involved in Iran Contra money laundering and also the money laundering and, and funding of terrorists as well, and a lot of other things that this bank did before, um, you know, it, it got um, sort of exposed for its illicit activities. Um, so she was directly involved in that. And also another thing that I talk about um, in my report is the Promise software scandal. And um, Jackson Stevens, to an extent, was also involved in that because he had a, um, a company called Systematics. And that was also um, basically the main developer of the, of the stolen Promise software for use of financial espionage, uh, which was used by uh, the intelligence during that time to track money transfers, um, and things like that, and also protect uh, detection of illicit money transfers the CIA was doing during that time, and that was a company that was owned by Jackson Stevens. Um, and during the litigation of, of the Promise uh, case, uh, Systematics was represented by Rose Law Firm, specifically um, Hillary Clinton and Vince Foster were involved in that case. So um, there's a couple other uh, connections to, that, to this network here. This is all going to the 1980s. Um, 
but allegedly uh, <laughs> Bill Casey uh, or Bill Barr uh, told Bill Clinton that uh, to, he was Bill Casey's fair haired boy, like Bill Casey really liked him and all this stuff uh, during this time. Uh, and there's some other uh, really crazy stuff um, uh, th that was alleged to have been overheard by some uh, people working for the CIA and some people that were at um, that conversation or that heard that conversation firsthand that I'll be including in my report. Um, Wait a minute, but, but, Barr, Barr said that uh, Clinton was Casey's fair haired boy or he was? Barr was no, 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 that, that Clinton was Casey's fair-haired boy because of his um, willingness uh, to lend Arkansas to the service of Iran-Contra and intelligence and, of okay. course, Hillary Clinton's uh, work in, in, you know, handling the, the legal angle um, that helped advance CIA objectives during that time. Um, this is a quote. Where did you get that quote from, from Barr? Um, I'd have to look it up. It's in the article I'm writing right now. Um, is there any way to pause the recording? <laughs> No, it's okay. no. So I'll. Um, it'll be in my report when it comes out. It's from a book um, that was written by someone with direct knowledge of this. So I'm, I'm sorry. So uh, I'm going to name my report. Right. It's hard to, uh, remember them all. I'm going to turn about thousands of links in these articles. So no, no worries whatsoever. Yeah, I, I can send it to you after the interview. My last question about uh, the suicide. Now, clearly there are a lot of people. You mentioned a bunch of them who would rather that. Uh, Epstein did not go to trial and a lot of facts would emerge that could implicate them. Now, the, the coroner's report has now come up with this uh, apparently fact that a couple of bones in his throat had been broken and that, that normally indicates strangulation rather than hanging, although in an older person, it could also mean hanging. So the way I see it is if in fact this did happen, uh, he may have been allowed to commit to try a second time and this time successfully by somehow getting the guards not to go there, um, creating the conditions for him to kill himself. On the other hand, it could have just been a screw up in the prison. Can't rule that out, can we? Um, well, um, there are a couple of things I'd like to point out here. One thing is that this prison, uh, just last year, um, a prison guard there was convicted for taking $50,000 in bribes to smuggle off, uh, smuggle things in that prison. Uh, and this is something that happens in, in other prisons. It is, it, it is not exclusive of this prison, but I think that, um, you know, um, strengthens the case that, uh, if Epstein did commit suicide, he was allowed to commit suicide or he was offered help to commit suicide because officially uh, the story is that he um, hung himself from a from the bed. Um, but pictures that have been released of the cell he was in show that bed basically being a concrete slab. Inmates that have uh, been in that prison or former inmates that have been in that prison say that the sheets are relative are, are like paper thin. Uh, Epstein was six feet tall and over 200 pounds. I find it unlikely that he was able uh, to hang himself with a paper thin sheet and end up breaking bones in the process. Um, I find that, uh, uh, I don't really believe that. Um, I think if he did commit suicide, it was, he was allowed to perhaps bring in a stronger sheet <laughs> if that were the case, for example. But, um, I think a lot of people were interested in him, in the criminal case against them going away. So for example, after news of his suicide broke, um, Prince Andrew, who was quite stressed out apparently by his implication in the Epstein scandal was all smiles the next day. Not that I'm saying that the Royal family was, was involved. But that's just an example that, um, people that were connected to Epstein were very relieved by his death, especially the ones that had, uh, their names, um, you know, heavily implicated in the scandal and had gotten that had gotten a lot of media attention as a result, including people like uh, Prince Andrew and Alan Dershowitz and, and the Clintons and yeah, things like Andrew, that. Andrew has stepped down now from any public role, that's what I understand, probably pressure from his mother. So I lied. I have one final question about Ghislaine Maxwell. Could she be sort of the, uh, the indicator about whether there's going to be a serious investigation if they actually pursue this woman. A photograph emerged that was in the New York Post. It's possible to tell whether when it was taken, whether it was staged or not, of her in a hamburger joint in LA. Do you think that they're going to go after her? And if they don't, what does that tell you? Um, no, I don't think they're going to actually go after her. Um, as part of the sweetheart deal, apparently, uh, that protected um, co conspirators from criminal charges. Um, so as long as that stands, uh, that sweetheart deal stands, it's unlikely um, that she will be charged. And that's apparently the reason why she hasn't been charged, even though that Epstein was later arrested 
Um, I think also, you know, there, there's a lot of oddities in this investigation and this case. Um, one example I said it earlier was the the extreme delays in raiding the the residences um, of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and the fact that Ghislaine was never even really questioned by the FBI, and if they really are, as they have said, continuing a criminal investigation into the sex ring, they should at least take her in for questioning. They have not done so. Um, for the federal government to act like they don't know where Ghislaine Maxwell is, I think is absurd, uh, considering the extent of surveillance uh, on the American civilian populace. Um, the NSA knows where she is, and if they don't, um, some other intelligence agency does if she's not in the United States. What I think we're seeing now in the mainstream media is an attempt to paint Ghislaine Maxwell as if she were Carmen San Diego. She just keeps popping up all over the country and no one knows where she is. Um, and you know they're just making headlines out of it like, oh, Ghislaine cited here. Um, what I want to stress is that according to victims, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell um, is a horrible human being and is an alleged child rapist. Um, a, a serial sex trafficker and a serial abuser when some of these young girls were taken um, and brought into this ring and they refused to have sex with Jeffrey Epstein, it was Ghislaine Maxwell that took away their passports, right? So, you know, this is a horrible human being and the fact that the press is, you know, playing this game of, look, here she is now and she's in Boston, no, she's in LA, no, she's here. Um, I think is is gross personally because it's like they're they're making this into a media spectacle and sort of just saying oh she's you know Epstein's girlfriend I mean I think that's really um, minimizing what she's accused of for one thing and I think it's sort of just you know um, I, I sort of think you know this photo right um, was clearly she she posed for it had a picture of her with a book talking about uh, the lives and deaths of CIA operatives. Um, and it's just, you know, to me, just an in-your-face sort of sort of message, like, we're unt I'm untouchable. You know, I think that's what that was meant to say. Um, or it was some sort of message that, you know, either she or people connected to her wanted to put out in the press. Um, there is no way of knowing when this photo was taken. There is no date on the photo. Um, in the New York, uh, I believe the New York Post published this originally. Uh, they, they don't say exactly when it was taken. They just say it was taken recently. Um, I think this is a way of toying with people and trying to distract from the real issue at hand. Um, and I think we're seeing that a lot with a lot of the, the Epstein coverage right now, there's being efforts to distract from major angles of the case, especially the intelligence angle of all of this. Um, aside from the fact with Ghislaine posing with, with, with this book, um, I think it, it needs to be highlighted that he was working for some intelligence agency. Um, um, you did tell us earlier how her father uh, apparently ticked off the Mossad and then they withdrew the protection, maybe even had him murdered. But did you explain why again? And if you did, I've forgotten, sorry. Why Epstein suddenly had his protection removed? Did he tick off somebody? Why did they, uh, why did they have him arrested and not given him bail? That kind of um, well, I don't, I don't think it's really known exactly, um, because even after he, he left prison, um, after the sweetheart deal, he was still associating with a lot of the same people and a lot of his same business partners. And he was actually advising prominent Silicon Valley companies like Tesla, right? So he definitely wasn't, he was a pariah in public, perhaps, but in private, he was not. Um, so a lot of his activities during the period leading up to his arrest were not exactly known. Um, though a few months prior, just I think maybe even one or two months prior to his arrest, uh, his longtime relationship with Deutsche Bank abruptly ended. Uh, he was known for decades to have been very interested in currency trading, um, and I would argue actually currency manipulation um, because of his past. And also one of the things that Lynn Forrester de Rothschild got to the Clintons about in relation with Jeffrey Epstein at a 1995 meeting was Jeffrey Epstein and currency stabilization together. Right. So he was known to have used Deutsche Bank for currency trading. Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, by the way, during that time was an advisor to Deutsche Bank. But Deutsche Bank abruptly ended their uh, connection with Epstein not long before his arrest. Um, and it wasn't exactly said why. So apparently, I'm just going to assume here um, that Deutsche Bank knew either something was coming or that Epstein uh, took money from the wrong people or did the wrong sort of trade. Um, and, and may have picked people off in the financial world. I think that is uh, one possibility that hasn't really been explored, but I think is an avenue worth exploring since it only precedes um, the, the arrest by, by a relatively short window of time. And as I said, a lot of his business dealings, uh, specifically in the past two years, aren't exactly known. Um, so for example, he was known to be advising uh, the company Tesla 
um, last year and uh, specifically Elon Musk and was trying to sort of um, get Saudi investors for Tesla. Uh, he apparently had a close relationship with MBS, um, Mohammed bin Salman of, of Saudi Arabia, who of course has only risen to prominence um, in Saudi Arabia in the past few years. So a lot of what Epstein was doing was going on behind the scenes. So it's hard to know exactly what was going on, but because, uh, you know, what, what something unique about Epstein and the sexual blackmail operation is that before he got involved in this, he was known to be doing a lot of shady financial activity, like I mentioned in the 1980s, doing, you know, um, hiding money for people like Adnan Khashoggi and African dictators um, and things like that. And from all appearances, why he was doing this stuff and um, with sexual blackmail operations would occasionally do this on the side as evidenced by his activities with Deutsche Bank. Um, so I think after his arrest, obviously, uh, it, would, it would have been much harder for him to continue his uh, sexual blackmail and um, sexual trafficking activities. So I think he may have gotten back into the worlds of finance, and there is evidence to support that. Um, and I think he may have mi perhaps misstepped there or angered certain people in those activities. But as I said, um, a lot of this went on in private because no one wants to admit that they're being advised by Epstein. It only really came out um, after he died, specifically that he was advising Tesla, for example, uh, was given, was told to a, a reporter off the record. And after he died, uh, that person assumed that off the record didn't matter anymore. Um, and it was reported. So I think, you know, um, that should be what people should uh, potentially look into to find out exactly why he was, uh, you know, taken down, first arrested, and perhaps killed in this way that it may have had something to do with um, financial, it, it may have had some sort of financial uh, link. Let's also remember, too, that Deutsche Bank is in a lot of scandals right now. A lot of people think it could collapse. I mean, it's also been accused of money laundering in, in more than one probe. So, um, you know, I think that is something that someone um, <laughs> with, with better knowledge of what's going on in Deutsche Bank right now should perhaps pursue. And there may be uh, yet more links to what was going on with Jeffrey Epstein that may explain his recent arrest. This is my really my last question. Um, my feeling was that uh, he, he realized he was at the end of the road. He lived in what was the largest private residence in Manhattan. And he was facing living in a prison cell with rats and whatnot, and that he did not want to live anymore. So that he genuinely tried to kill himself. And now a story has emerged where he apparently told friends that he thought he was going to get off again. And he was optimistic. And he wanted to go through with the, the legal process. What is your take on that? And then Elizabeth, please finish this out. Thanks. Um, well, I, I've seen reports too that he told people close to him that his first alleged suicide attempt uh, was actually a murder attempt and that he was afraid that he may be killed. Uh, and those were the same people that also confirmed that he had been in good spirits at the time of his death. According to his lawyers, he um, before he died, he had planned to cooperate with the government. Um, so um, I think, you know, both theories that, that there are, there's evidence to support both theories. What I think is really interesting, though, is that in mainstream media, there is still no consensus about what happened. Normally, when there's high profile deaths, especially when they're under mysterious circumstances, there's a narrative that emerges with mainstream media. Uh, quite quickly, where they say, this is what happened, this is the official story, believe this, but what we're still seeing almost a week after he died is that um, there's people in the mainstream press that are reporting evidence that suggests he was murdered, and there's people um, reporting in the mainstream press that this was a suicide. Um, as I point out, uh, or as I said earlier, either way, I think that he was allowed to do this. I don't think this was some fluke in the prison system, considering who he was and that he had just been on suicide watch. Um, a few days, you know, a few days before he died and that his cellmate was taken out the day before he committed suicide. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, strange things going on there. But what I think is really telling is that there is no official story in the mainstream media. So that either means no one knows what's going on or that there's an effort to really just muddy the waters around this and just keep people guessing. Um, so it, it's really hard to know in either case. In the age of WikiLeaks going forward, it only takes one um, FBI agent reading that uh, the the Little St. James, it only takes one person within the government to access this material, potentially leak it either to the public or to an organization like WikiLeaks. Do you think there's any possibility moving forward that there would be a significant leak of uh, that would expose these types of networks to an extent that would go far beyond the kind of um, infinite connections that you know you're able to map, but where we really can't 
pin anything on these individual people who always seem to get away with these crimes. Do you think that there will ever be a leak like that? And um, as a kind of you know mirror of that question, do you think that there will ever be real serious prosecution of either the individuals running these these rings or of the or some sort of um, you know pushback against the agencies that you know in your article and series you explore their involvement in them? Um. Hmm. Well, I think it's possible that this may be leaked out, but what I also think may have been going on, especially with the seizure of the, the electronics, especially if um, one uh, studies the corruption of the FBI and their own involvement in these sort of rings, is that this may have just been a changing of hands of the blackmail that Jeffrey Epstein had, and that, you know, um, within the U.S. government and also uh, among in international intelligence communities, uh, or in fact, the CIA or Israeli intelligence would seem to have been um, involved here. Um, there may have been, there, there may be factional infighting, in which case if the FBI acquired all of this blackmail uh, that is now in their hands and they now have that leverage over the powerful people that Jeffrey Epstein had, if that had not been shared to a full extent with those same people. Um, so what we may actually see, it, well, I'm really cynical, right? So I tend to think that, you know, um, one corrupt guy with blackmail, now it's changed hands to another corrupt institution that is known for historically using blackmail. You know, J. Edgar Hoover, the first FBI director, was famous uh, for his use of blackmail against people like Martin Luther King Jr., um, you know, among many other famous public figures. Um, so um, I, I'm, I really, um, as I mentioned, with, with Bill Barr uh, being in charge of the Justice Department, I don't really see an honest investigation um, coming from the Justice Department. There is the option of a congressional investigation, um, but that depends on what percentage of people in the U.S. Congress have been blackmailed, whether it's by people that were connected to the Epstein ring or that were that have been blackmailed by, you know, other factions of the U.S. government. Um, James Rothstein, that NYPD detective who, um, you know, received that admission from Roy Cohn that he was involved in this sort of stuff, said that he estimated that as many as 70% of the U.S. Congress is blackmailed at any given time by these sorts of activities. I think that's very, uh, <laughs> it's a very high number, uh, frankly. And the fact this has been going on for decades, it's really unknown how many people um, it entrapped. It was known to have not just entrapped uh, politicians, but prominent people in the military as well. Um, so it's really hard to know um, exactly um, what's going to happen going forward. It depends on if uh, the F Epstein's blackmail, which was known to be a stored on these electronic devices and hard drives and things like that, uh, whose hands that's in now, uh, what they'll end up using it for, um, if they'll actually, you know, um, pursue the people involved. From what I've seen, um, not just Elaine Maxwell, but people like Leslie Wexner or another uh, co-conspirator, Jean-Luc Brunel, who was acquiring uh, girls for Epstein, some as young as eight years old. He hasn't been questioned. There's been no effort to extradite him uh, or arrest him. Uh, not even, uh, I, I think France was going to open their own Epstein probe uh, that would assumably or presumably involve uh, Jean-Luc Brunel to some extent. But the fact that you know, we, the public, know who these co-conspirators were, and we know who the FBI should be chasing down. Uh, the FBI is not chasing them down. We, uh, anyone with a brain would think, oh, if you're investigating Epstein, honestly, you would raid all of his residences as soon as he's arrested. It's been uh, months now, and at least one of his residences, the one in New Mexico, hasn't been raided. Um, arguably, the most notorious resident, the island, wasn't raided until after he died. Uh, and I just think it's uh, it's really bizarre. Um, I would really, of course, like to see some sort of big public leak of what was going on um, at that time. But um, given the U.S. government's war on whistleblowers and people like Bill Barr being in charge, um, and you know the example they're trying to set with with people like Julian Assange, I, um, I as I said, I tend to be cynical, so I don't um, expect such a leak unless people are really brave. Um, that are involved in this, and I would, you know, um, I would like to put some hope uh, <laughs> back in people that are in the FBI or other places in government that could um, expose some of this. Um, but it's also um, important to point out that it's it's really people in in independent media um, that are bringing a lot of these angles out that the mainstream media is ignoring. So I think that's also um, uh, important to point out as well, especially considering the mainstream media has been complicit in these sort of activities for decades, and in that some of them are leading sort of this effort to distract from from the bigger picture here. And I haven't really seen, um, you know, a lot of many mainstream media um, 
articles that have been criticizing the investigation or like the delay in the FBI raid. I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, and I think that's kind of telling. I really wish uh, there would be more push from the mainstream media for that because it's kind of obvious. But I think that's just going to have to come, I guess, from independent media. And I think also um, a lot of the outcome here is going to depend on public outrage. If people um, are angry enough and if that outrage is sustained then maybe we'll see something but if, if, if the media or the government is successful in shifting um, the prevailing narrative from Epstein to some other um, scandal or mass shooting or what have you some other event um, then they'll probably feel that it's easier to cover this up and keep this quiet um, so it's it's um, anyone that wants to see justice done here it is um, you know imperative that you speak up um, and demand accountability because if if nothing changes here and this is just another one of these operations that gets covered up by the federal government or gets ignored from the press and fades out of public view these sorts of activities will continue uh well into the future and um i don't think honestly i think if if americans or, or really anyone is not outraged by the fact that um the, the government and intelligence agencies have connections to pedophile rings um, and and are protecting child rapists. I I, um, I don't know what will make people angry enough to, to speak up if this doesn't. Absolutely, well said. And I think that that is unfortunately, uh, you know, it's a it's a sort of, you know, it's a it's a down note to end this conversation on. But I think it's very necessary to if if people don't realize how dire this is, that it's not going to change without them standing up and speaking out then I think there's that potential for apathy because it's an uncomfortable subject. Nobody wants to think about the government that they pay for with their tax, with their tax funds being involved with or protecting these types of operations. But uh, yeah, if we don't face that, then we're essentially turning our backs on the children that are used in these operations. So I think it's really important that you've done this incredible coverage of this ring and this network. And I, and I thank you for coming on and speaking with us. It's been great to talk to you. Great, thanks so much for the opportunity. And that wraps up this edition of CN Live, and we'll see you next week. Get out your notebook. There's more.